Hi from me, Lauren Jaffe, and welcome to another episode of Derek Eretz. The criminal justice systems around the world often spark lengthy debates about the rehabilitation of prisoners. Today we meet Dr. Baz Dresinger, the founder of Incarceration Nations Network, and we find out more from those involved in the life-changing Prison to College Pipeline program. But first, Rabbi Thurgood speaks to this topic from a Jewish perspective. It's a little known fact that although the Torah lays out several elements of a justice system, that is what's called an ideal justice system. When the Torah speaks about the way in which certain people are treated as a result of their crimes, it's less for a practical measure and more for educational reasons. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, the great halachic authority in America in the late 20th century, for example, said that although the death penalty exists in Judaism, its per- purpose is not to execute people, its purpose is to teach people how serious the law is and how important it is to do what is right and just in society. So although the Torah lays out a justice system, it really, as a practical matter, leaves the specifics of a justice system to every society to work out what is best and what is proper. What the Torah therefore gives us is a set of values rather than prescriptive instructions. Instead of telling us, this is how we deal with crime and punishment, the Torah gives us a set of values. We must make sure to try to balance to the best of our ability these different values in every society. The one value, for example, is the sanctity of life, the protection of every individual, the dignity of the human being, and the need for safety. Now, what we can see when it comes to the criminal justice system is the way in which those values are so often in conflict. In order to make people feel safe and secure, we need to remove those committing crimes from an environment in which they could commit crimes. But on the other hand, by incarcerating people and putting them in prison and putting them in sometimes very inhumane environments, that is not protecting the dignity of the individual, of the ones who have uh, done those things, and it's also not necessarily providing them the opportunity for teshuva, for repentance, for return. One of the keystones in Judaism's moral values is the idea of teshuva, is the idea of coming back to Hashem, coming back to who we are supposed to be, the idea of personal improvement and personal redemption. We are not defined by the mistakes that we have made. We are not defined by the bad decisions that we have taken. We are defined by our aspirations and our good deeds and the ability that we have at every moment to turn our life around. And so as much as we need to think about how we can create a safe and just society where every individual can feel that they and their rights are protected and that their dignity is protected, at the same time, we must be thinking about people in prison and previously incarcerated individuals, how we can protect their dignity, how we can give them the opportunity to grow as people, to put right to their mistakes, to not be defined by things that they have done that they no longer want to be a reflection of who they are. One of my greatest heroes is Rabbi Arya Levine, who was a prison chaplain in Jerusalem in the mid 20th century. He went to a prison in Jerusalem every Shabbat for decades and uh, rain or shine, he would walk up the steep hill to, uh, to that prison to be there for the prisoners. And they have uh, they've written in their, uh, in their memoirs of the event, they spoke about how if you have never seen this uh, Rabbi Arya Levine coming to visit us, you have never known the power of faith and love. He arrived with such love, with such compassion, with such empathy. People flocked around him. He opened his heart to them. They opened their hearts to him. It was such an example of unconditional love, such an example of modeling the kind of decency and respect for every human individual that is so much a part of what Judaism is and so much a part of the vision for how the world could be and the way in which the Torah 
encourages us and calls upon us to think not only of society in terms of its problems, but to think proactively how to balance these values, how to protect every person, how to enhance the dignity of every individual and how to work together to create a society in which we are truly moving forward in terms of our ways that we relate to and respect one another. Dr. Baz Jezinger hails all the way from the city of New York. She cares so much about social injustice that she started something called the Prison to College Pipeline Program. Today we find out a little bit more about her and also what exactly the program is all about. I come uh, from a line of Jewish New Yorkers. Both of my parents are native New Yorkers, children of immigrants from Eastern Europe, Russia, uh, and that part of the world, and definitely was raised in, in a culture of do good behavior, of, you know, tikkun olam, of make the world better. And I think everyone in my family, which is a pretty large family, is in the business of service to others one way or another. In 2016, I published a book called Incarceration Nations, and it was a first-person journey through prison systems of the world. And uh, that book ultimately ended up becoming a movement and many of the people and the organizations and the countries that I connected to in order to write that book, I stayed in touch with and that network started growing and I recognized that there was this global movement to reimagine justice and, and do prison systems differently uh, that wasn't connected and so my goal became creating a network that would connect the various people around the world doing this work. And so I slowly started visiting, uh, revisiting and visiting various countries and connecting with organizations on the ground and ultimately built Incarceration Nations Network, which is a network of 115 partners around the world. Uh, in uh, We have partners on every continent doing a whole host of different kinds of prison reform and justice reimagining work, and especially in their work changing the narrative around crime, around the word, even the word criminal, and getting people to think about what smart justice looks like as opposed to just harsh, punitive justice that funnels people away into prison cells. Before I started Incarceration Nations Network, I was, while teaching at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York, uh, I launched a program there called the Prison to College Pipeline. And it's a university program inside prison that also guarantees people a place in university when they come home from prison. So it's both education on the inside and also reintegration support in such a way as to make education the centerpiece of someone's time inside and also their time on the outside. And there have been many, many graduates and many, many success stories. Um, that really was more than anything else, more than any book learning. It was through learning from these students that I gained any understanding of what justice really means. And so I would say it was, you know, my, my schooling in, in being able to do the global justice work that I do now, which is broader than education, but is, is always grounded in education. And um, it also is what first took me uh, global in the work uh, because I began collaborating with institutions in different parts of the world to create versions of the prison to college pipeline in these countries. And the first and foremost of them is South Africa. So the program, the prison to college pipeline initiative that is based here in Cape Town at Stellenbosch University, which is called the Ubuntu Learning Community, is now one of Incarceration Nations Network's partners. Every Thursday at 10 a.m. we would take a bus from Stellenbosch University all the way to Brunflay Brand Correctional Facility and we would take 22 outside students and have 22 inside students and we engaged in courses together but the classrooms looked nothing like a university classroom. We were engaging in conversation and talks the whole time and what came out of that course over and beyond the knowledge we had learned was the connections and the relationships we had built. I didn't have to study when I was incarcerated. I could have easily taken the road most traveled, the most popular route, which is entering into gangsterism, you know, drugs, continuing 
um, to become or to be a minister to society. Right? I decided, I made a conscious decision to get myself educated. The importance of education behind those four walls or behind bars is so significant because it allows individuals to continue to walk the right path. It gives the individuals and their families hope in the sense that you can hope for a better tomorrow or a better future. You know, you can equip yourself you can actually mean something and contribute positively towards society upon reintegration. So it's, it's those positive stories, it's those feel-good stories that encourage us you know, to persevere and make the best of what is a very difficult situation. Empowerment is critical. Uh, upliftment is empowerment and the idea really is for people like myself to sit down and take a back seat and let the leading happen by the people who have lived experience, people who are you know that close to the issue um, and have direct involvement in the criminal justice system. So so much of what we do as an organization um, is 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 allow that to happen and um, and support the development of formerly incarcerated and incarcerated leaders all over the world um, who are the ones to, to lead the way. And so that kind of work, that kind of work that puts them in the front seat is very much what we're about and, and is critical, again, to not just this movement, but to leadership development, period. The greatest leaders, I mean, South Africa has evidence that the greatest leaders come from behind bars. And so how do we, all of us, avail ourselves of that wisdom? We were a group of 25 students when we first started. And from the 25, there's 22 that have been released. Only three are still back on the inside. So it has allowed us to have a community in the real world, so to speak. It has allowed us to form a, a, a brotherhood amongst each other, where we're able to assist each other, whether it non-academic, mind you, it could be just motivation, it could be a word of encouragement, it could be, you know, some financial support, you know, we also help each other out, out, out like that. It has basically meant the world to every single person that's involved in the program. I think of it as an honor to be working alongside these individuals. Um, my, my, you know, partners here in South Africa, most of whom are formerly incarcerated, who I met in prison, who are doing all kinds of beautiful work, um, they inspire me every day. I thank them every day for allowing me into their community um, and for building alongside me in this movement. So that, you know, and that genius, I think, is, is the thing that we need most um, and South Africa needs most in order to turn around, you know, the ways that, that capitalism have taken us way off track. I guess my way of the world in the simplest way possible is um, to bridge the gaps between the worlds that we exist in, the inequities. Um, and, you know, I, Incarceration Nations Network's motto is correcting and connecting. And so creating those connections, bridging worlds, um, bringing communities together, uh, connecting this person with that person from this nation, from this community, from this class, from this race. Um, and it's through that kind of connection that I think we move to a place of justice. And so uh, connections are something that I do. Connections are something that I think have the power to change the world uh, and to make us move toward living in the world that we want to live in. that social justice isn't just simply achieved by sitting back and having easy conversations. Right now we find out more about a documentary that goes by the name of Incarceration Nation. It involved filming incarcerated people around the world having tough conversations about social justice and the education system at large.
Well, I've been in prison since I was 16. I'm 34 now. Providing prisoners with college opportunities is not a popular idea. Why don't we teach college in prison? New York Governor Andrew Cuomo introduced a plan to publicly fund college programs in 10 state prisons. It faced opposition from both parties and was quickly shot down. There's a lot of conversation about prison reform in the U.S. because we are home to the world's greatest, uh, highest number of people in prison, 5% of the world's population, 25% of its prison population. Obviously, this is direct legacy of, of slavery and institutional racism in the U.S., etc. And then I'd say that in the rest of the world, where prison reform is highly unpopular, the challenge is having those conversations that people don't want to have, addressing this issue that people don't want to address. They want to shove it to the side. They want to sweep people under the carpet. They want to just disappear human beings by warehousing them away and then imagine that that's somehow going to make a safer society. We know that's not the case. And so I, I think um, pushing back on that is, is a continuous challenge everywhere in the world. And I think specifically in countries with high crime, uh, like South Africa, where there is a lot of legitimate fear and anger, then the idea of, you know, quote unquote, prison reform becomes especially um, difficult for people to grasp. And so there's a lot of pushback. And so, you know, those are the conversations that we want to have. All of our events, including our screening event tonight, they're about having those conversations. The more we are having the conversations about people who are in prison, and the people and the challenges that they are facing on the outside, it helps people to ask uh, critical questions. Critical questions in a sense that, okay, these guys, they are in prison, and then when they finish their time in prison, where they are going to go? How are they going to survive? And if ever we're not able to solve those questions and help the, our clients who are in prison to reintegrate outside the society, that means that we'll be creating a problem. But when we are able to answer those questions very seriously, we know that if those questions are being solved, we are going to end the recidivism rate that is so high in South Africa. There, there's an episode about women, there's an episode about restorative justice, there's an episode uh, about education. You're gonna see two of them tonight and, and the first of them being especially significant for this moment um, because it is to some extent the world, well it's the world premiere outside of prison. Research indicates that prisoners who participate in correctional post-secondary education are 51% less likely to be reincarcerated. It's too soon to know if this program will be successful because only 36 men have participated. Seven of these 12 students have been released and six are already enrolled in college or are applying for admission. Only one is back in prison. The title of our um, INN's docu-series uh, episode about this issue of education is called Education Not Incarceration. And what that means is, number one, um, education instead of incarceration. That if we truly want to talk about um, addressing harm that people may have caused, addressing issues of crime, then we should be giving people access to education, which opens the doors to opportunities. Uh, and I've seen this all over the world in prisons. People who go to prison around the world were not given first chances at education. This is not a second chance that they get. They, they because of systemic racism, systemic inequality, um, they were deprived of that opportunity in the first place. So we need to always be pushing for more equity um, that offers people access to education in the first place. And then we also need to offer access to education for people who are currently incarcerated as a lifeline, as a way of redressing the harm that we as a society caused them by not giving them access to education in the first place. Um, and also in a way that, again, benefits us all. But we know that people who are educated in prison overwhelmingly around the world do not go back to prison and go on instead um, to become you know, soldiers of peace in the community. Society doesn't welcome you back with open arms. It's difficult to find a job. It's difficult to have support, you know. It's, and unfortunately, with the Department of Corrections or with South Africa as a whole, is the whole catch and release scenario. The department spends so much money. They put so much effort, so much resources are put into the correctional process. Yet when you're released, you're on your own. 
So it's very difficult, but my advice or my encouragement to anybody that's back home is don't lose hope. They say it's always darkest before the light. So if you continue to persevere, you continue to you know, educate yourself, you continue to wake up every single morning and try to find a job, you, you just keep persevering, you will get there eventually. So my, my main advice would be don't lose hope. When I was watching the, the, the docu-series and um, I'm thinking of the struggles that we were going through at the time we were shooting the, 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 the series when, when Dr. Best came to visit and now, where I am now, uh, yeah, it's amazing, it's an, it's, sure. it's an amazing journey. But um, what I can say is that uh, out of all those struggles, that we have gone through, the end product that came out of those struggles is what you see today in front of you. Is a responsible citizen, is a person that's got vision for his community, is a person that wants to make a change where he is currently. You know the struggles that I'm going through currently, but those struggles are just minor to what I have gone through. One of the highlights occurred just the other day when uh, my collaborators on the ground here and who was incarcerated in that facility at Drakenstein Correctional Facility was featured in our docu-series of, called Education, Not Incarceration. We have a docu-series with 10 episodes and that's one of them. Um, and he's in prison and we screened that very clip showing him in prison and here he is today. He came as a speaker at this very esteemed event uh, and is shortly to receive his law degree from UNISA and ultimately again go on to impact the world. That moment seeing him speak on stage at this event at the same prison where he was incarcerated and to be able to say that not only is you know is he achieving great things but he's achieving great things for the world for South Africa um, in ways that again come back to benefit us all that's really what this work is all about it's saying how do we invest in in people um, because that's what truly benefits us all as opposed to throwing people away which doesn't benefit us Well, we've come to the end of the show for this week's episode of Derek Eretz. As always, we'd love to hear from you, so please send us a Facebook message at Derek Eretz Connect. From me, Lauren Jaffe, and the Derek Eretz team, have a beautiful week. <laughs>